Pastor Don has been in a great, great series called Unbroken. And he opened it up by talking about forgiveness, how in our lives there is a level of brokenness that will always exist until forgiveness has its perfect work in our heart. The relationships that we're in, the way that we see life, it will be broken. And so forgiveness has to be the attitude of our heart so that we can live an unbroken life. I encourage you to go listen to that if you didn't get to. And then he followed that up two Sundays in a row. He was like, man, I wanna talk about marriages. That's such a valuable relationship. And, and so I wanna give it two Sundays, and he did. And it was powerful. So make sure that you go back and listen to those. And today, uh, I have the privilege of talking about relationships outside of marriage. We're gonna call it unbroken relationships. Uh, I, I toyed with making it friendships, but, but that has a different meaning to different people. So I led with unbroken relationships. And Pastor Don gave us a foundation scripture, Psalm 11, three and four. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Boy, howdy, everything's coming apart. Life is coming off the rails. What do we do? The Lord is in his holy temple. That's like, well, okay. I think I was kind of trying to figure out how to stop this other thing. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth and his eyes examine them. Boy, howdy, that's so powerful that when everything is going crazy, we can remember that it didn't catch God by surprise. He is on his throne. He is still reigning in his temple. So it's gonna be okay if you will apply his principles to your life. Um, when Pastor Don did that, I immediately thought of Psalm 89, 14, which says righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Boy, howdy, how good is it to know that when we approach God, when we're thinking about God and his thoughts about us, that the very throne that he's sitting on, the establishment of his throne, the foundation was set up from justice and righteousness, that his decisions, his actions are coming from a place of justice and righteousness on behalf of his kids. And then his actions and his attitude are from a place of love and faithfulness. He's faithful when it feels like the foundations are being destroyed. He's faithful. Mm. Now I'm gonna give you a little caution. Matthew 7, 24 through 27 says, anyone who, this is Jesus by the way, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand and when the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Jesus says, listen, I got a bunch of teaching in here. And if you apply it, when the flood waters come, your house will stand. When it feels like the foundations are going to fail, if you've built it on this, if you've applied the teaching, it won't fall. But if you don't apply the teaching, it will. It's just that simple. Man, I said this first service, I, I don't mean to sound uber Christian or anything, I, if there is such a thing. Uh, for some of us, reading was difficult when we were younger. Maybe in high school, it wasn't a pleasant thing, and so we approach this the same way. But this is life. The Bible says that, that the Word became flesh. You want to know Jesus? He's right here. He exists in the pages of your Bible. Get in here, you will get to know him. He will talk to you through this. And I think that sometimes we forget. Yeah, no doubt, God's word. I think that sometimes we forget. Uh, if you research the history of this amazing collection of words, you'll find out that, that men and women gave their lives so that you and I could have one in our home. 
The words are literally written in the blood of other people, starting with Jesus. And I think that if we'll approach it that way, then maybe they won't collect so much dust and maybe it won't just be a coaster for our coffee mug on our desk, but it'll be something that we'll read and we'll let it get inside of us to transform us and change us. All right. In the very first message that Pastor Don gave, he said, in order for relationships to work, we must let the one who designed them define them. So today as we talk about relationships, we have to remember that the one that designed them, which I'll give you a little hint, it was God. We have to let him define them. And then we have to apply what he says we should do in those relationships because the storm is coming and your house needs to stand. A little bit later in the message, I'm gonna share the story of a couple from Tree. I have their permission to share their story. And the foundation of their marriage was being torn away in the very beginning inception of their marriage. But they applied some biblical principles. They allowed relationships to be what they should be in their life and God saved their marriage. We're gonna hear about them in a little bit. But for me, I see two primary types of relationships for us as Christians, two primary types. And the first would be our relationships with non-believers, our relationships with non-believers. And that can be anyone, by the way. That can be family members, it can be your friends before Christ, before you said yes to Jesus at Tree of Life Church. There were some people in your life. Maybe it's your neighbors, your coworkers. It can be anyone that doesn't know him, okay? That's a large subcategory, and I know that. But these relationships all have the same goal, and if we aren't careful, we will try to handle these relationships differently, and it won't work. These relationships all have the same goal. Let's look at Luke 15, one through seven. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Boy, howdy. Uh, if you work for the IRS, he wasn't talking about you, it's okay. Tax collectors get this bum rap, don't they? It's like tax, co- they don't even get included with sinners. Tax collectors and sinners. It's like, man, that's rough. They were different back then. If you have friends or family at the IRS, pray for them, they need it. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. He's saying, look, if we're not careful when we're doing life, we see the sinners around us and we can try to avoid them and not be around them. Or we can be guilty of doing life with them in the same way that we're supposed to do life with other Christians and in that, the lost don't get found because that's not how he said to do it. There's an intentionality that has to happen. And our goal with any relationship in our life, I don't care if it is your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your fourth cousin twice removed. If they don't know Jesus, the goal of that relationship is to help the lost be found. Somebody did that for you. Somebody helped me be found. And that's so important because it's, it's easier said than done. Uh, sometimes we view relationships a little differently. We can go to a restaurant where our waiter or waitress is waiting on us, and our only thought is, I just want him to get my meal right, and I would like for it to be hot when it gets here. And cold if it was a salad, by the way. Um, and we can miss the moment and appreciate that, may, wait a minute, this one might not know Jesus. Like for them, it can just be about bringing you your food. That's okay. But for us, it cannot. Uh, I use disc golf as an example, first service. I like to play disc golf, and that's where I go to, to just be in the zone. My man JJ hooked me up with that. It's become a little bit of an addiction. Thanks, JJ. Um, <clears throat> 
Sometimes when I go out to play, it's just me, and it's just me in the course, and I can worship, and I can be with the Lord, but here's this interesting thing in that culture that'll happen. Sometimes you stand up to a tee box, and up comes somebody else that doesn't have a partner to play with, and they go, hey, man, can I play through with you? And in that moment, I have to remember, I need to figure out if this one knows Jesus or not. I got 17 holes left. I gotta figure out if they know. How can I help introduce this one to him if they don't know him? And I don't have to grab a Bible and a bullhorn and preach three, me three point message to them, okay? In that moment, man, we're just out there and to them, we're just having a good time and they're trying to smoke me on their card. It's probably not gonna happen, but, because uh, every good Christian knows you disciple by winning. I'm just saying. Um, and <laughs> grace comes after, that's how it works. Uh, but in that, they can think we're just having fun. But I gotta be figuring out how to bring faith into it. By hole three, I'm asking, hey man, you go to church anywhere? Man, I noticed that tattoo of a cross, what's that mean? And if they tell me they're a believer, well then this looks different. I can just have fun with them and enjoy it. I can find out if there's something I can pray with them about, it looks different. But if they tell me, church, why would I do that? Oh, well, now I'm on mission. Now I'm on mission. And I structure what I say and what I do around that moment. And it takes intentionality and it's hard. We can't think like they do. For us, it's about helping the lost be found. Look at 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 15. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? That's another word for Satan. Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? He's saying, look, our life with them has to look different. Amen. Listen, we, could, we need to be in and around them, but we don't do life with them from a manner of just going out and having a good time. That's not what those relationships are for. Here, I'll balance that for you. Uh, this is not in your notes. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. Write that one down. Go home and read it for yourself. That way you're not mad at me. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 and 11. The same man, Paul, that wrote this passage out of 2 Corinthians said, hey, I wrote you a letter before and in it I said, don't hang out with the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the swindlers, the drunkards. And then he says, I didn't mean non-believers. <laughs> He said, that's not possible. We're, we're supposed to win the lost. Hang out with them from the lane of helping them see Jesus. What I really meant was, if you're hanging out with brothers or sisters, they say they know Jesus, but they're living like they don't, well, don't hang out with them because they're messing up the mission. They're making it difficult for lost humanity to see Jesus. It's really pretty cool, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. Because God wants us to have a transforming influence on the world around us, not the other way around. And if we're not careful, if we don't view these relationships right, the world will influence us. We won't look like we have anything else to offer. It's so dangerous. So make sure you have the right mindset going in. And I would dare say this, uh, there may be some relationships you just need to break completely off. Look, when I said yes to Jesus, uh, I came with, a, with some baggage, boy. And there were some people I didn't need to hang out with because my faith wasn't strong enough yet. I mean, my heart was I wanted them to be saved as well. I mean, I really did, but I couldn't handle it. I wasn't ready for it. And after a couple of years of praying for them and me building a solid foundation, then I was able to step back into their world and by the grace of God, almost all of my before Jesus friends are now saved. But it couldn't happen until I was ready. I had to not answer the phone for some of them for a little while. Uh, a couple more scriptures. Matthew 5, 13 through 16, this is in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is a huge chunk of scripture called the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus preached it to the masses, and in it he said, listen, if you follow me, you are to be salt on this earth, the flavor of heaven to a lost and broken world. And if salt has lost its ability to taste like heaven, it's no good. And he said, 
or be light when you step out into the world. Don't look like the darkness, be light in the darkness. Offer something different. And then in Matthew 28, 19, we call it the Great Commission. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples. He said, go out there with the goal of making disciples. Help the lost be found. All right. Then number two would be relationships with other believers. Relationships with other believers. And we have a great passage of text in Acts 2, 41 through 47, to help us see the definition of what these relationships should look like. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles and all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Boy, there's a lot of direction in there on how we should handle relationships inside the kingdom with other believers. The first thing that it said was is that that they were listening to, they were applying the apostles' teaching. So our relationships together should be about learning godly, biblical truths. That's one thing. That's one part of this relationship is to learn godly, biblical truths. And then it says they, they fellowshiped, they broke bread together. Fellowship is an interesting term that if you research it, it means to do life together. It means that our lives become intertwined. We do life together. And the breaking of bread, it wasn't like they were just sitting down with some stranger and eating a happy meal. No, breaking bread was a very intimate thing. Like you broke bread with family. And he says, that's what our relationships here are supposed to be about. Not with the guy at the disc golf course that doesn't know Jesus. And then supporting each other in prayer. It says they were devoted to prayer, just like we prayed for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine and in Russia this morning. That's what these relationships should be about. This is why we do what we do. We should be supporting them in prayer and each other and then taking care of each other. Just an overall taking care of each other. It says that, that they were so closely knit, they had everything in common. So JJ finds out that he needs a set of tires and he ain't got any money. Pastor Eric, I won't say you sold your new dog because that'd be wrong. <laughs> Sell some of his kick and shoe collection so that JJ could have tires for his car. It says that that's how they did life together, that nobody had any needs because the church, the body of believers took care of themselves. They took care of their neighbor, of each other. And that's really how it was designed. <laughs> The welfare system ought to be right here in this room. We should take care of each other and then we should be figuring out how to take care of the world outside. That's really how welfare ought to work. I'm just saying, I'm not running for anything, by the way. Um, <laughs> now I want to outline a few other truths in the minutes that we have left about our relationships, our friendships with other believers. And I want to do so uh, from from the lane of this couple that I told you about. Uh, some of y'all know, some of y'all would know them if I said their names or if you saw their picture. Uh, I did ask their permission to share this, so just know that. So if you walk with my wife and I and I didn't ask your permission to share anything, it's not about you, <laughs> you're safe. Uh, <laughs> and I'm gonna call them Jack and Diane. Why are you laughing over there, Mr. Bustos? What, you don't wanna hear my little ditty? About Jack and Diane. <laughs> Jack came from a very broken home. Uh, it was very volatile. Um, it was kind of like he always knew the volcano was going to erupt somewhere around home. He just wasn't sure when and where, but he knew it would. Uh, in that, he was a loner. He learned to be a loner. He didn't really want people over at his house because he knew that stuff was going to eventually go. <laughs> and he didn't want anybody to be around that. In that, uh, by the time he was a young teen, he began to anesthetize the pain from that uh, by experimenting with drugs and alcohol. 
he had a massive chip on his shoulder and it was coupled to a fuse that was about that long. Uh, that's a dangerous combination, hair trigger, so to speak. Now, Diane, she came from a Christian home. It was a broken home, but her parents ended up getting remarried and uh, she grew up in a Christian environment and she was the opposite of Jack. Like she was whatever the extreme opposite of not loner is, that was her. Life of the party, every cloud has a silver lining, the glass is always half full. When she walked in the room, everybody was glad she walked in the room. But somewhere in her teen years in high school, her faith began to take a little bit of a back seat. And before she knew it, she was what we would call backslidden. She was away from the Lord. Uh, but she still enjoyed partying, not for the sake of the party, but for the sake of the people. And so that's the lifestyle she was living. And then by chance, through a mutual friend, Jack meets Diane, and he was smitten. Uh, he would say that his world was kind of a monochromatic gray, and she was the splash of color in it. And, and he really wanted either her or a gal like her, but he fully understood that gals like Diane did not go out with guys like Jack, or at least they shouldn't uh, if their parents were, had anything to do with it. <laughs> but interestingly enough, over the course of the next month or so, they just kept ending up in the same circle. Like, it wasn't intentional, it just kept happening. And then one day, Diane let it slip that she liked Jack. And so he began to, man, he began to pedal, you know what I'm saying? He's like, I gotta take advantage of this. And he did everything that he could to capture her heart. They moved in together shortly after that. Uh, he's like, man, I better move in with her so nobody else does. And shortly after that, she became pregnant. And up until that point, she had never really seen this Hulk smash side of Jack because he was just so happy. He had captured the beautiful red rose in his world, if you will. But the pressure of knowing he was getting ready to be a dad just began to mount on him and how he was gonna take care of this family now. And in those moments, he would crack. The fuse would get lit and boom, he'd set off like a powder keg. He was never physically abusive to her but he would yell, throw stuff, break stuff. And then coupled to that, he had this really nasty habit. Whenever he was in that place, if they had gotten into a tiff, his defense mechanism was to go and isolate. So he'd go sometimes three or four days without even talking to her, simply because he didn't wanna go Hulk smash. But her being the life of the party, she needed that interaction so it wounded her every time he did that. That's not why he was doing it, but that's how she received it. And then one day something amazing happened. Jack got saved at work. A believer appreciated that in the environment of his vocation, he could help the lost be found. And Jack got found. <laughs> It spurred Diane, she rededicated her life, and they immediately found a church, immediately, like within three or four days. Uh, and once they found that church, within three Sundays, they were serving. So it happened really, really fast. Um, but he didn't really have any relationships outside of just serving. They got married, and after they got married, just the pressure continued to mount. Uh, they had their first kiddo, and it just kind of stayed that way for a couple of years. And she got pregnant again. And Jack did not know what he was gonna do. Uh, he knew that things weren't right in his home. He knew. He could tell, he'd look at her. There was no smile on her face. There was no sparkle in her eye. He knew. They bumped into a family at church. And they allowed this one family to finally become friends in their world, so to speak. And Jack would confide in him, man, I'm missing the mark, dude. I don't know what to do. I'm missing it. There's no smile on her face, and I know it. 
And unbeknownst to Jack, we'll call this other individual Bill, Bill began to take that information and woo Diane. He began to try to win her heart. And over the next few months, he would tell her stuff like, man, you just leave him, I'll leave my wife, we'll get married. Man, it'll be a beautiful, godly marriage, all of this stuff. Uh, and after several months of that, Diane let Jack know that she was pretty sure that was the option she wanted. And who could blame her? Who could blame her? Jack was devastated. He called his pastor. He was the only person he knew to call. You see, he didn't have any relationships. He just had some people he served with. But because his pastor had seen him serving here and serving there, serving everywhere, his pastor took the phone call. And he encouraged him and he prayed with him. And then he told Jack to do something that was just so hard. He said, I want you to let me connect you with another man to mentor you. And man, Jack was like, well, I already tried that. I'm gonna hit the road, man. I'm just gonna run, I can't do this. He was afraid, his trust had been broken. But he'd been around church long enough to know that he could trust his pastor. And so he did, he let this other person in and this man began to meet with him. Proverbs 18, 24 says, there are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. This new man that stepped into his world told him, I will be in the trenches with you for as long as it takes. And he meant it. And they began to pray because Jack wanted another chance. He didn't wanna lose Diane. And so his newfound friend began to pray with him as well. And after only a few days of that, God answered their prayers. Diane's eyes were open and she appreciated that if Bill was willing to stab his so-called friend in the back, leave his own family, that he was probably a snake in the grass. Her eyes were opened. So over the next few weeks, they began to dive into their marriage and it was hard. They fought a lot. Uh, they called each other some names that were not real nice, but they stayed committed to each other and they kept meeting with their newfound mentors. Jack with the man and then Diane with his wife. And they began to speak hard things into their lives because hard things is what they needed to hear. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. They kept meeting with them so that they could be sharpened, godly friends. Meeting with godly friends will always sharpen us. I dare say if you aren't being sharpened, you need some new friends. If you aren't being sharpened by the relationships in your life, you need some new friends. Because inside the context of friendship and relationship here, there will be times when you are sharpened, but there will also be times when you do the sharpening. And it goes back and forth. That's the amazing thing about this thing we call Christian family. And then Proverbs 27, six. Faithful are the wounds of a friend who corrects out of love and concern, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful because they serve his hidden agenda. You see, Jack and Diane's new friends, they were, it hurt when they met with them, it hurt. Because they were hearing what they needed to hear and this couple was only speaking it to them because they cared. They were concerned. And truth be told, if you were to talk to Jack, he would tell you that when he met with Bill, the betrayer, before this, that he would say, hey man, here's what's going on. I need to fix it, I don't know how. And Bill would tell Jack, no, you're doing great, keep it up. Just keep it up, buddy, you're doing great. Keep plugging away. They were the kisses of an enemy. He was telling Jack what he wanted to hear, not what Jack needed to hear. If all your friends ever say is what you want to hear, watch out. Mm. Man, God really did some work in their marriage. They ended up having another kiddo. They started leading groups. And God began to use them with other married couples that were in trouble to see deliverance and freedom come into those homes. Jack, Diane, and their precious family are proof that if you allow the one that designed relationships to define them, the formula 
works. You see, had Diane and Jack listened to their non-Christian friends, they'd have told Diane, kick that bum to the curb. Jack's drinking buddies would have told him, man, there's plenty of fish in the sea, partner. You don't need this mess. We can't do life with them that way. You got to do it here. This is the safe place. Daniel, can you put that picture up there for me, buddy? Thank you. Go ahead and hit reveal on that. That's Jack and Diane. Relationships inside the house of God restored our broken marriage. Listening to godly friends say hard things saved our marriage. And then applying those principles, when the storm came, our foundation was restored by the God of heaven. We just celebrated the birth of our third grandchild yesterday. None of those things would have happened. If you've been hurt by it in the past, trust the process. Do it again. Have more than just one confidant. Get two or three of them. Get in a group. You have an opportunity after this to go join a tree group. You need these people in your lives. And some of those people need you in their lives. You have the answer for the storm they're going through. Don't waste that. Go sign up for a group. Plug into the all-star team. Listen, God's going to make sure that everything that needs to happen in the house is going to happen. Uh, so we're not asking you to sign up for the all-star team because we're begging for help. If I, had I not known the senior pastor from serving all over the place and he wouldn't have taken my call, I'd have called the next guy on my speed dial and that guy wanted to go to the bar. You got to work it the way that God says. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The day is approaching. <laughs> it's approaching. And in the original text, other translations say uh, the assembling together of God's people. It's actually a construction word. It's what a brick mason does with a bunch of bricks. One brick is pretty strong, but what, what really makes it strong to all our contractors in the house is when you connect it with other bricks with mortar in between it, you go from having a single brick to having a house that somebody can live in. That's why we do this with each other. And then we go out and we help the lost be found. And then I close with the same scripture I opened with, Matthew 7, 24 and 20 through 27. It only does any good if you apply the teaching. Some of you are in relationships with people that are non-believers and you're using those relationships to try to do life. You're going to them for advice and for direction and it won't work. Be in relationship with them for one reason, help the lost be found. Come here for advice and direction. Go to your group leader for advice and direction. Go to the other people in your group for advice and direction. And when the storm comes, your marriage will be saved as well. Or whatever other storm you're navigating and going through.